Good evening. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Accra Shep. Accra and I met on a balmy uh, August evening last summer uh, at Cat Jam. Um, some old friends of Accra's um, got together and bought a dilapidated Shakespeare camp uh, up in Sullivan County, I guess. Somewhere up there in the in the in the in the in the Catskills, and every summer they invite all their friends to come up there and camp out, and they invite musicians, and they had this amazing band from Mali, and my first impression of Accra was him dancing with his shirt off at like you know midnight out under the stars, just, and then at one point twerking. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> And, uh, and then the next morning, um, he was sitting outside on a bench in the sun having a cup of coffee, and we had a very brief uh, conversation that convinced me on the spot, and then confirmed after Googling him and checking out his work, that he had to come here and visit studios and, uh, and talk to you guys. Because um, I think he's, well, you will soon see, uh, those of you who haven't met him yet, um, what an amazing, uh, creative personality he is. He's also a New York-based photographer whose work looks at international protest movements and how natural environments influence human interaction. In 2011, Accra began, uh, he documented um, the Occupy Wall Street movement in Zuccotti Park, and a selection of this series was included in the book, uh, The Order of Things, which was published in conjunction with a show at the Walter Collection uh, in Germany. His work is in the collections of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, and the Museum of the City of New York, among others. He's had solo exhibitions at the Whitney Museum, the Chicago Cultural Center, and the Martha Schneider Gallery, and he's been included in group shows at the Brooklyn Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, Photography Gallery, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Anacostia Museum at the Smithsonian. Currently, Accra is at work on a survey of more than 40 islands that make up New York City and is also completing an artist book for Public Art Commission in Luxembourg. He received a BA from Princeton in art history and studio art and an MA in art history from the IFA, the Institute of Fine Art at NYU. He's represented by Stephen Kasher Gallery here in New York. Please join me in welcoming Accra Shep. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Mark, for inviting me. Um, uh, wow, okay, I don't want to take too much time because I do talk a lot and we, there's a lot to go through, but I'm very impressed by all the work that I saw this afternoon. I hadn't known I was going to see like the entire encyclopedia of all art that people make <laughs> in one afternoon, but I did. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to say is that I am not a photojournalist. I'll say it again, I'm not a photojournalist. I don't even know how to do what they do. Um, and so it was 2011, and I was like hearing reports about like something happening downtown, and I emailed friends, and they were like, we're out of town, I don't know what's happening downtown. And so I went downtown, and I was just blown away because in my city, something miraculous had happened. I mean, something terrible had happened years earlier. Um, the political pendulum had swung so far to the right that everything I had grown up as a child with was erased, kind of like a big wind had come along and blown it all away. And now it seemed that the pendulum was swinging back the other way, and what's more, it was like swinging back right where I lived. Um, so I went down there um, the next day with my 4x5 camera and um, because I knew I wanted to see things really, really closely. And that meant I needed something with a big piece of film, something to record a lot of information. And this place where it was, the protest was being held, Zuccotti Park, it was really dark. I love these kids. These are kids from, oh, some university in Florida. They had come up. They just like came up from Florida. It's just wild. Um, and there's no light in this park. It just drains everything of color. So it was like, OK, well, I don't need color film then. I'll just use black and white film, so I'm good. Um, 
And I thought I would be done right away. I thought, wow, look at all these people with video cameras and all these people with all these devices of, for, for capturing images. Oh, you know, I can get back to my other work soon. And I would talk to these other artists and I would take a look at their work that they were posting online and no one was seeing the protest that I was seeing. And it's interesting because since that time, people your age are really concerned with social justice, even as you do all the other things that you do in your very busy lives, including getting high and partying, you're still concerned about social justice in a way that I can honestly say that the, path, the generations, the two generations that came before you, not so much. And in that time, I was like, what I saw were individuals. I saw this woman, she was working in food services, donated food. People were just driving up to the protest and saying, hey, I got a carload of stuff to give you. Where should I put it? That's what was happening. People didn't know where the protest was. They just knew it was downtown. I just went to Wall Street and listened, figuring I would find it. So I was interested in individuals. That was one thing that I couldn't understand what people couldn't see, because the people who made up this protest were all people who had just, like me, decided to go. And at first I didn't include myself in them. It wasn't until a couple of years later that I decided that I could say, yeah, I'd been part of it, because I was documenting it, which meant that I was looking at all sides of the protest. Because you can't really have a protest just with one side. You have to have opposition. And I was interested in all sides. So I wanted to photograph the police. I wanted to photograph the business people. This guy was just brilliant. Because I was so afraid of photographing the police. Because, you know, well, they could break my camera. My camera's made out of wood, by the way. So it's just, it's not like, you know, it's, and it's on a tripod. And I have a hood over my head. I'm just like, I have to make sure that I'm on the good side of everyone. And so I very timidly asked this guy, I said, so can I, can I make a picture of you? And I have the camera right in front of me. And he kind of goes, Humph! and then he turns and gives me this profile. And I'm like, okay, that's a yes. <laughs> and um, I mean, it's like he's like got such an amazingly powerful face, straight out of central casting for your strong cop guy. Um, So coming back to this idea of um, the protest being individual, something that I kept seeing and I kept hearing afterwards, it's like people wanted to understand the protest as a sea of people. They wanted, they wanted to see little, little circles for faces and lots of hands. They wanted to see a mass of humanity. I mean, I, I frankly, didn't understand what that was supposed to mean. Um, I mean, there is the very famous photograph that Ouija made of, the, um, of, the, of, of Coney Island with the masses of people, but it's brilliant because we can also see individuals. I love these, oh, God. So. Yeah, Ouija photo is up at the Brooklyn Museum right now. That's right, that's right. Go along with the show here. And I better go see that show because I haven't seen the Coney Island show. It's closing soon. Um, so the woman, the young woman on the left, I saw her first, and I was making her photograph. And then she said, can my friend be in the photograph? And I said, oh my god, yes, absolutely. Because to me it was just such a powerful, a powerful thing to say that these two young women in hijabs were part of Occupy Wall Street. They were students at the time at the borough of Manhattan Community College. I didn't get their names, and so sadly I didn't get them a copy of their photograph. I tried to get everyone a copy of their photograph um, because they were nice enough to stop and let me make their picture. Um, but the idea that they could be part of this protest, that they are part of New York, part of the United States, is something that too often is lost. The idea that, that everyone gets to belong. Now, 
Of course, that's something that we're coming to grips with, especially in this election year. But in New York, that's something that we take for granted. That's something that I really, really love about this city. Um, and evidently, I, I read a book called The Island at the Center of the World, talks about the colonial beginnings of New York City. It was kind of built in right when the Dutch came. She's amazing. I didn't even get where she was from. She's my hippie chick. Um, she's just great. Um, and so to circle back around, so I thought that after a couple of weeks I could leave off. But I wasn't seeing these photographs of these individuals. I was seeing people making glib images. Um, the very first photographers I saw at Occupy, there was a video crew from MTV, and they were there that day to photograph all the hot guys, hot single guys, at Occupy because it was a great place to meet them for the young ladies. It's like, okay, yeah, great story. Um, and all of a sudden I was faced with this very strange situation. Oh, she's terrific too. She's from CBS. She was, at this point in the protest, the city had said, you have to keep the park clean, otherwise we're shutting you down for health reasons, which was the reason, that's how they actually got, they, they cleared away everything because that um, health trumps um, freedom of, of assembly. If, if it's unhealthy, if we're going to have a Zika outbreak, you can, yeah, you can clear the room. Um, so they had raised the tents, because it was getting cold at this point, up on those wooden pallets that they use um, at the loading docks and around supermarkets. She was doing a story, I kid you not, on what pallets are. It was like, WTF lady. It's like, if people around the country don't know what pallets are, don't know that this is the best forum for, for, for breaking that information down. I mean, and I was like thinking, you know, honestly, you know, to get a gig at CBS is no small thing. You've got to be like really great, not just smart and articulate, but like off the charts. And I was like, have you like dyed your hair too many times? What happened? I don't know. I mean, I know that's really mean to the blondes. It's terrible. Um, but I was like left really wondering, what was that about? I mean, I knew she was intelligent, but that was just really dumb. So anyway, so I'm there at the protest, and I'm realizing I'm surrounded by people who are projecting bizarre concepts onto this thing. I just went there. I didn't know what I was going to photograph the, each day I went down there. I didn't even know there were going to be people. I would go down there, and I would set up my camera, and then I'd ask people, would you mind if I take a picture of you. And I realized I kind of had a, res I didn't kind of had, I definitely had a responsibility, a responsibility to make these images. And you say responsibility to who? Well, to all the people who would look at them, which means you now and the people who've seen the work around the world so far. And that was a weird thing for me because before, I'd been responsible for making images that were sincere, that spoke clearly, that were true in the capacity that they had to be true. And I think you understand what I mean by that. that you know, there doesn't have to be any one-to-one -one correspondence with, with events as they unfolded before my eyes, but they had to be honest. But now I was responsible for something larger. This is a former stockbroker from Estonia. Yeah, one of the Baltic states. He flew in. Didn't know how long he was going to stay till the money ran out. He just came because he had to. It was like that. You just met people from you didn't know where. And so there I was, and I was stuck going there at the beginning twice a week making dozens and dozens of photographs, not knowing what was going to happen to them. This is a doctor from, oh, I think he's, 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 he's has an appointment at Rutgers, I think, some school in New Jersey. 
and this is an, oh, I didn't put the nurse in, this is, this is Dane, who is also working the, um, the food area. Um, and I mentioned this idea of responsibility because I think it's important to talk about in the context of what you're doing with your own emerging art practices because there is a responsibility that you have, that we all have. I mean, Dr. Mark here, he, as a physician, manipulates the human body or, you know, aspects of the human body, kicks viruses, butts, and things like that, we hope. Um, and we, as artists, manipulate cultural artifacts or the culture directly. And that's a really weird, diffuse thing, but that's what we do. We make things that become part of the culture. We take pieces of the culture and refashion it. And that's a big responsibility because that culture is what is transmitted from generation to generation. It's what makes a place a place. I mean, if you take the culture out of the United States, if you take away fried chicken and Michael Jackson, if you take away, I don't know, McDonald's and all, and all of Hollywood and all of, you know, not just Michael Jackson, all of Motown's gone, and every single image you've ever seen that was made here, Jackson, Pollock, all those, what's left? You don't even have Donald Trump because he gets to be part of the culture too. So, if culture is everything and we're the people who make the culture, and manipulate it, that's kind of a pretty big responsibility. It doesn't mean you can't have fun and the work can't be playful. But kind of what I was taking away from the Occupy work was that, wow, sometimes it comes down on you like a, like a ton of bricks. But it's like, I was, I was there. I was ready for it. Um, this is Sue and Kyle, and I will mention not to embarrass you, but Sue is here in the audience tonight. Um, I'm working on a project now re-photographing as many of the original um, people I photographed in this first go-round in 2011 and 2012 um, because so many of the people, like Sue, are working still in social justice and in brilliant and diverse ways to push these social justice movements forward. And of course, this has been one of the important legacies of the Occupy protest. Many people say, oh, Occupy, well, what will it do? Well, it basically changed everything. From the $15 minimum wage that is now, we'll see in New York City, to the cancellation of the Keystone <coughs> XL pipeline, um, Black Lives Matter, all of these things had their start at Occupy, where people were talking about prison reform in a large way, in a way that connected people from all over the country. This young man is trying to bring free Wi-Fi to all of Brooklyn, and will probably do so. Just share a few of these. So I made these in the form of a diary. Um, you can see it says occupying Wall Street and then the date underneath. And I did that because I needed a shorthand, a way to organize everything. And as boring and as simplistic as a straight chronology seems, it really works because this is how we understand our lives, the world, as unfolding linearly. And it meant that I, I didn't have to invent a structure. I didn't have to risk being arbitrary. I could be purposeful straight away, which, was what I, which is what the work needed. So the evening of November 14th, I was coming back from teaching in New Jersey that evening, and I was getting texts and all kinds of messages about the park being cleared. I couldn't make it. It was a good thing I didn't go. I probably just would have gotten my camera broken or arrested or both. But I went the next day, and it was it was, it, was, it was very telling. The police officer on the left 
is a member of, he's a division of the police force. The acronym is T-A-R-U, TARU. And when I Googled it, Wikipedia had an entry which basically led me to believe that it's the spy division of the NYPD. They're responsible for monitoring all kinds of communications and things like that. That's what they do. So they're spies. And um, again, I asked them permission, and Officer Rivera said, yeah. So they were great. Um, but then after this, um, I was showing the work at Stephen Kasher Gallery. Um, it was a massive wall at the front of the gallery, and I kept updating it every week with new images. The police came to visit the gallery to see what was going on. I know they freaked out the gallery staff. It was like, I wish I'd been there. Um, but it was one of those things where it's like, honestly, don't they know? It's like, I was hardly surreptitious. I was like the tallest person there with a wooden camera. <laughs> anyway, so many people thought that after the park was cleared that the protest ended because if you don't tell a story, it goes away. And that's the nature of the world. We understand everything through stories, or as people like to say nowadays, narratives. A narrative can be as simplistic as once upon a time, and then something happened, and then they fixed it, and they lived happily ever after. That's a nice one until you're about 12, and then you're ready for more sophisticated narratives. Um, the narrative that you know best is the one that you tell about yourself, about once upon a time, each of us was born, and then other stuff happened to make us the person we are now. Does it bear any relationship to what actually happened? Doesn't matter. Probably not. But it's true, all of it. And so in the narrative that was spun out about Occupy Wall Street, it ended when the park was cleared. But I didn't get the memo. And so I just kept showing up as long as the protesters showed up. This man, oh, so sad. He died about nine or 10 months ago. I, when I went to contact him for participating in the new project, I found out his name was Jim Labenthal. He was the largest municipal bond trader in New York City. Um, bonds, for those of you who don't know, are um, ways of making, um, like if you have to build a bridge and you're the city of New York, you will sell shares in the bridge, and when the bridge is built and people pay tolls, you'll pay the money that people gave you plus a little extra, the interest on the bond. And so a municipal bond dealer does bonds only with municipalities, cities, because businesses can also write bonds to create new factories and things. So he is like major captain of industry on Wall Street. And he's there supporting. In fact, he, he's got his GoPro. He's making a video of me <laughs> photographing him. Because before he was the largest municipal bond trader, he was a photographer at Life magazine. I thought he was like totally yanking my chain. And then I Googled him, and I was like, holy cow. Not only that, but we went to like the same college. It was like really crazy. Anyway, so the story didn't end when everyone said it ended. So all through the winter, people were coming out. This man was a translator for the Navy, translating Arabic transmissions. Yeah, he came out to support from Tennessee, not a local. I know, aren't they amazing? I was so sad. I contacted him for the reshoot. His wife has passed away. He's sick in bed now. I may rephotograph him, but it's just like they look so vital then. It, and their dog was just, the dog is gone too, sadly. But it was just it was really brilliant. I first saw um, um, Ellen, I think is her name, yes, Ellen, with the scarf. I said, I got to photograph that lady with the scarf. She's great. And then I saw who, she was, who was attached to her, and I was like, OK, I got to get all of them. <laughs> <laughs> now, sometimes people ask me, this is Yahira. I have, she's very hard to reach. I got in touch with her. Still works. She's working on immigration reform, working with immigrant communities, both documented and undocumented. Um, and this was a march um, in the dead of winter that had to do with um, migrants, um, uh, immigration rights. So it was uh, people from all over Central and South America, primarily. Um, they said, well, how did you know who you're going to photograph? And I didn't really have a plan. But I would look at a person, and typically they weren't the people holding the signs. 
because the signs felt rather obvious to me. But if they seemed sincere in their actions, and you could kind of tell, the people who were jumping around and who had on the loudest masks, the people who, who didn't seem to have received enough love from their mothers as children and were looking for it from the crowd now, I didn't like glom on them. You can imagine, all the television cameras loved those people to pieces because they were just so animated and too ready to give them what they wanted, but that didn't seem to me to be representative of what was going on. And that was another reason why people seemed to feel that the protest was something other. They saw a carnival sideshow because that's what plays well on television, and so the cameras would turn to the sideshow. And whenever you have a large group of people, trust me, you will get some comedians all too willing to, you know, find attention where it will be given. Ashley Love, oh my God. A name like a secret agent. She's working on a documentary of, um, about uh, violence against women in LA right now, working really hard to rephotograph. I'm working on that part of the budget. She led a spontaneous march. She just got up there speaking extemporaneously about the injustice of the distribution of, uh, of, 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 of money in the United States and led an impromptu march, kind of a la um, Captain Kangaroo room or Romper Room. You know how they would go marching around all the little kids would fall, just like that, and people were following her. And it wasn't like she was embarrassing them. They were happy, and they hadn't planned on it. And this was just an amazing thing to me. I kept seeing things like this there. My Black Power Trio. That's what I call these guys. Um, the one group who I photographed who said no to me most often when I asked to photograph them were black men. And as a black man, that was hard. But I got it. Though the Black Lives Matter movement had yet to be named by several years, I understood their reticence because their visibility at the protest, their visibility in media, meant they were more identifiable. And that could be a liability. Not that they had done anything wrong, but they could be accused of God knows what. So I was really happy when they said, sure. And then they gave me this, and I wasn't expecting that. And it was just so beautiful. I was just a little kid in the 60s, but I remember the 60s well, and it kind of took me right back. I got the names of two of them, the two on our, uh, well, I guess on your left, and um, the one on the far right, he ran away rather than give me his name. I can still see him in my mind's eye kind of sprinting across the park, because I guess if I had asked him, he would have been honor bound to, to, to answer, so I couldn't ask him. Oh, this is, oh goodness, no, uh, Karen, Karen Hoffman, from Hamburg originally, in Germany. She came to the United States when she was 15, and she spoke so eloquently about how unequal things had become. She talked about the United States that she had arrived in in the 50s, being very unlike the United States that she lived in today. The idea that health care should be rationed out, this was before Obamacare, but even now a very imperfect system indeed. You know, just unable to get ordinary, any, um, any medical care. Um, and her sign says, I am a job creator. It's just terrible, terribly funny. She's belonged to the Fiber Arts Working Group. All the people in Occupy, they typically split off into working groups where they would do things. Um, Earlier, you, uh, I, I didn't point out, but she's in the fiber arts working group, knitting warm things for people. That's Luis reading Blink. And you can see the park is kind of empty now because it's mostly cold. But there were a few people there every day, Milagros. I got his name as Zion, but somehow I don't think that's what his parents named him, with an X too, not even a Z, Zion with an X. Um, but he had tattoos on his face, and I felt, oh God, he was from Florida. He was one of, I call them feral children. You know, these kids that have just kind of been tossed to the wild and raised themselves. Um, you only hope for the best for them. But, you know, he was very present for me. This is Captain Ray, retired police officer with the Philadelphia Police Department. They have a very scary uniform, the police department in Philly. That looks like totally like the Third Reich, if you ask me. But 
no one did ask me, so they, they just go with it. Um, I had a conversation months later about this police officer with a member of the NYPD who was very dismissive. He said if any cop participated in this protest, it meant that they were probably a bad cop, meaning on the take or somehow otherwise derelict of their duty as a police officer. And it was interesting. In the conversation, it became clear that it wasn't just a matter of the law. The police understood this as a protest that underscored economic inequality, but one where the people protesting were all privileged and had time to protest and had leisure and weren't, and weren't helping other people and they weren't enjoying themselves, but they were making life difficult for the police who worked very hard. And it was a funny way of looking at the world, but it is a way of looking at the world, and it's not, it's not a priori invalid, even though it's effed up. And I think one of the most beautiful things that I took away from this protest, and I saw it happening not only with myself, but I witnessed it with others, is that these conversations were possible. I could actually engage the police officer and ask him, what he thought, and he actually told me. And I worked really hard not to judge him and not to respond with any retort, because that's not why he answered me. He didn't answer me so I could try to change his mind. He answered me so that I could understand his <coughs> point of view. And I worked really hard at that. This is Barbara Olson, originally from Iowa. Loved her, very stylish. So at this point, the protest had moved to the steps of Federal Hall. Um, and I thought for sure now, because the protest, the ranks had swollen, people were camping out again. It didn't reignite in the end because they figured out ways to, um, uh, they, they, made, they told people that you could only have like 20 people on the steps at one time. It was a weird thing. It was public safety. Um, oh, the kids from York Prep School. Oh, they came down on their own steam in their coats and ties to see what the protest was about. Oh my gosh, I mean like, uh, you know, kids, you know, and they're, yes, their parents were, you know, captains of industry, you know, Upper East Side kids, the whole nine. And I was really proud of them. Um, this is a nun, this is the Episcopal Church was out in force this afternoon. Um, Fatima, yes. She was not wearing her, um, her scarf when I went to ask her to photograph, but she said, no, I have to put this on. And at first I thought, no, but I won't be able to see you. I thought, well, she did the right thing. And typically, I would allow people to present themselves how they want to be presented. She looks really scary there. And this is Robin, who was, this is the closing days. This is the day before the last day I photographed. And this is the one year anniversary of the protest, which, I, which is when I bowed out. Okay, so now I've left myself like 10 minutes to go through all of these images. But this is what I turned my attention away from when I went to Occupy. I was looking at all the islands that made up New York City because we live in a city, my God, with over 40 islands. Who knew? Where do they put them all? Um, mostly hidden behind barrier walls and things like this um, and the associated waterways. So this is Bowery Bay and that's the Francis R. Buono Jr. Memorial Bridge that takes you out to Rikers Island. And right underneath the pilings of the bridge you can see LaGuardia Airport. Um, I'm going to zip through a few of these um, and then I catch my breath and talk some. Flushing Creek. I forget what creek this is called. It's like Dutch Creek or something like that. Yeah, I know. It's got that kind of Vato Fragonar sky going on the top. I hated that crap when I was younger, but then I kind of learned to like it. Um, one thing I have to point out here, it's like, you know when you're little and you're like tracing the map of the Mississippi River or some weird thing like that or the Nile, and like the river starts and it's just like a single line. And it's like, what the? is that, it's, this is a single line, and then it grows into a, something larger until you get to the big river. And I looked at the photograph, I said, bloody hell, look at that. It just does that. That's just not right. <laughs> oh, thank you, Mark, yes. 
So I'm working with a 4x5 camera, again with this, here in color. And when I work in the landscape, typically I put images together because the landscape is too big to fit in one frame. There's no way to put it all in there. And there are changes that happen in the landscape because I'm moving my camera across. Um, but that's not to say that these changes don't exist within a single frame. It's just that we've learned to ignore all the changes that happen. There's one place where we don't ignore the changes, and that's when we see a photograph of ourselves. When we see a photograph of ourselves, all the changes that the camera makes in translating a three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional object become glaringly apparent, and we say, that is not me. <laughs> and of course it isn't. But it is a reasonable approximation of you. You can rest assured, and no one sees what you see. So you can go to bed and rest easy. Um, but the black lines are the frame lines between the negatives. So the 4x5 negative has a very distinctive shape um, that has to do with how it's held in place. Um, the analogy would be the sprocket holes in a 35 millimeter roll of film, where that helps move the film along. So these dark lines represent areas where part of the film holder holds the film in alignment. And this is um, the other side of Bowery Bay at a um, sanitation depot. This is the entrance to the Queens Midtown Tunnel where there is no water visible but a water crossing. And I love the fact that the man and the woman in the opposing posters are in the exact same pose <laughs> with equally come hither stairs. She's selling beer, by the way, just in case you get any notions. What's he selling? He is selling Abercrombie and Fitch, which is just another word for sex. Yeah, because that's all they do. And it's, it's just boys' sex. I mean, they have a few girls, but it's really just boys. You, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so this is the sanitation depot. You can just see Bowery Bay just over there. So I'm not one of these artists who has to be really like, oh my god, water's got to be in every picture, an island has to be in every picture. It's like this is about the condition of us being surrounded by water and what flows from that. This is the Newtown Creek and one of the crossings over it. This is um, Staten Island after Sandy. So we were in Queens, now we're in Staten Island. Um, this is Eltingville, which is near a marina, and the boats were just floated up and landed all over people's houses. That is Loretta Dune. I mean, the, the, yes, that's New York City. The New York City, this is Shooter's Island. Um, I have a show coming up at Snug Harbor on Staten Island, April 9th it opens. Um, it'll just be the Staten Island work. Um, and this work is big, so this work is about 10 feet wide, so this is about, this is about right, this size here. Um, that's Prawls Island. This is Noe Maldonado at the Tottenville Marina in Staten Island. That's a machine that lifts boats out of the water. Isn't that cool? It's like, who knew that even existed? Building boats in Manhattan at the Village Community Boathouse. Um, this is Friends of, uh, Friends of Something Park in the Bronx with a kayaking um, day for kids from the Bronx. Friends of Brook Park. Village Community Boathouse. Fisherman on the pier. Don't eat the fish, but he does. Um, kids from the Harbor School um, on Governor's Island. Governor's Island. More Governor's Island. Manhattan, rebuilding the bridge. This was commissioned by the Studio Museum in Harlem. I'm racing through now because I, 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 I don't want to keep you guys too late. Um, sludge boat, sludge. You flush the toilet, it goes to the place where it goes, they make sludge, it goes on the boat, they sell it to people to dry it out for fertilizer. Sludge boat. Wow, I know. You, yeah, now you know what happens when you flush the toilet. No, they just, 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 just growing crops, baby. Um, this, is the, this is the 36th Avenue Bridge to Roosevelt Island from Queens. City Island. Oh, I love this, Poland's. They, houseboats on, 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 on the Westchester Creek in Manhattan. Houseboats in New York City. Yeah, go. And Poland Spring, because that's where we, it's, it's so fresh and beautiful there. Um, and more City Island. This is, um, this is um, Co-op City, and I'm, it's, I want to say Pelham Bay. It's Pelham Bay is to the left. I forget this body of water. It'll come to me later. Twin Island um, in, the, in the Bronx. 
Franklin Island, Dead Horse Bay, great name. And before Dead Horse Bay, it, the island got, uh, some islands have been reconnected to the mainland. It used to be called Barren Island. Um, there was um, a, um, a factory that, um, that took care of destroyed horses in the 19th century. So before there were cars and there was horses and horse shit everywhere in New York City, when the horses died, they took them to Barren Island um, to make glue out of them. Oh yeah, it's like that. A view from, from Brooklyn, from Queens to Brooklyn, that's the BQE, and then this is the last image again at Dead Horse Bay. Okay, so I'm gonna turn the lights on quickly to show you a couple of images from a real project, a real, real project, these are real projects. Um, from, it, it, I'll gear so far away, but let's see how I'm gonna do this. So this is an artist book called Atlas, and I wanted to bring this because in my practice, I'm concerned with our relationship with the world, as you saw. The world includes people, so I'm concerned about our relationship with other people, but in that concrete way that it's about how we interact with each other. So this book is about how we use the human body as a metric for the Earth. Um, so the elements of the Earth that I used were real leaves. So that's a piece of a real leaf there. And on the other side, you can see that the veins of the leaf come through, and I've got the image of a palm of a hand, so they merge with a scale of miles. And I'll just share a couple of leaves of that. And so this work talks about a body of work that I didn't show you yet, where I print photographs on the surface of leaves. Now, these are photomechanical images. These are colotypes. When I work in the dark room, I work typically with silver gelatin emulsion on the leaves, but this book, which is the one that the Whitney owns, exists in an edition of 12, and there was no way I could do that photochemically. Um, when I work photochemically, I get maybe three good prints, max, <laughs> that are the same. I couldn't do 12, so um, unless I had an army of me and an infinite number of, uh, of amount of funds, there was no way. So the book, the text which I wrote, kind of takes us from the earth to the water, to the sky, and back again. This text says, ancient Oceanus, the brother of time, encircles the earth with a great river of water. From his embrace rise all the stars in the sky. And that is actually this man's hair going around a leaf. Um, and so the way the images in the text function, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. One refers to the other, sometimes obliquely, so that once we have this idea of embrace, you know, here this is the most literal I get. This is an image of man's arms outstretched, overprinted with a chart of star luminance, which talks about the, the brightness scientifically of various stars in the sky. Um, here again, this text, we lie, aw we lie awake afraid for sleeping off dreams, where the earth sings of shadows that sleep slow lullabies of the end of time. And the landscape which is shown is far than the human figure is the landscape, than the leaf is the landscape coming ever nearer. And we have the shadow of the leaf behind. So the leaves appear as real leaves, as bleed through shadows, as, as ink, as impression. So the leaf, the image of the earth appears in a variety of ways. And I will share one more image and one more text. Well, two more images and one more text. Yes, that is Bear Mountain. So all the photographs are by me, all the text, except for the very beginning. I quote this thing from King James Bible because it's like the creation of like the land and the seeds and plants. Those are the 19th century photographs that were taken up in the Hudson River Valley. Oh. The Hudson River Volcano. That's right. I hadn't thought about them. I could have I saved myself a train trip, but I didn't remember <laughs> that. Um, Honestly, no. It was like that. Actually, I had to reshoot that mountain. The first time, it was a part of the Holyoke Range, and the mountain just wasn't very good. I needed Bear Mountain, something with a clear thing. So this is um, a portrait. Of, well, here, here, the first page here. The, you have to be set up. This is the dark and the light side of the moon with a leaf that kind of feels like the moon. And then you get to the next page where it is the shadow of that leaf that feels like the moon, and another leaf that's round, and the little poof at the end of her hair, which also feels like the moon. And then 
in the last bit of text. I'm going to have to read you this. It's the text that's inset in the little bit, so I can't read that upside down. It's too little. Brother Fox was drinking from a still pond and gazed in wonder at the moon's twin sister who lived in the water. He called to her and asked why she did not join her sister in the arms of their brother, the sky. She replied to him not, but only shivered in the cool evening air. The owl in the tree above saw the fox and said, Brother Fox, do not call out so, for she cannot hear you. That is not the moon's sister, but only the sleeping earth dreaming of her faraway daughter moon. And then the last image is this one here. So that kind of gives you an idea of how the text unfolds. And the meaning of it is such that it's not to be read as a straight linear narrative, to bring back that term that I brought up earlier, but it's a narrative where there are various waves. And one doesn't cancel out the other, but they don't match up perfectly. And so by the end, you have a larger understanding. But it may take going through once or twice. You go through part of it, you get it. And that may be how it goes. It's, it's very flexible in that way. So that's what I have brought to show you today. Thank you very much. So are there any questions? Yeah. Yeah, just, um, I have like a question, two, two questions and a comment. Go for it. Um, but I was just wondering, like, because when I, when you were going through the photographs, it seemed like, and now you've read the story, it kind of makes sense that like the story of the people is, it seems like that's also important to you as well as just like the visual experience of looking at the photograph. And I just wonder like when someone's in a gallery and they don't, they're just looking at the image, and they might not necessarily know the backstory of the... Oh, I tell you that because that's fun and people are often yeah. curious. But when they don't have the backstory, they have to invent one. And when these images are seen, typically, they're not seen individually. They're in a large grid, um, maybe 20, 30 pictures at a time. And so the protest is recapitulated, but individuals standing in each of their own frames. Um, and the other thing is, is I don't, do you know this artist called Mark Wallinger? No, I um, want to, but I can't say honestly I do. He's a British artist who's represented by Hauser and Worth. Okay. Um, and he did this piece called State Britain, which was to do with like the protest in Britain when England went to war in Iraq. And he like recreated um, that piece um, as a installation. So I thought of... No, no, I'm going to write his mark with a C or with a K? K. Okay. Um, I will look it up. And my final question was, the person who you spoke about who's like trying to get the free internet in Brooklyn. Charlie. Oh, uh, you didn't, yeah, because I was just, what? So Charlie, um, originally from Arkansas, has a really <coughs> wild history. He's just kind of all over the place. But he's always been focused on technology and it's a very interesting story for me personally because coming up as he did in Arkansas, he didn't have access to an educational system that would permit him to study technology. So I think he was studying philosophy because that was the closest he could get. And so he learned how to write and he was in, I believe he was in his senior year as an undergraduate when Occupy came up. He wound up abandoning his studies entirely and fell into protesting. And then after, I didn't mention this, but a few weeks after the one year anniversary of Occupy, Hurricane Sandy struck. And almost the entirety of the Occupy community became Occupy Sandy, literally overnight. And he was very much a part of that. And through that then went into growing food hydroponically in urban areas so people could have fresh organic food. And then he was trying to bring free Wi-Fi to Kansas City, but the people he was working with were a little bit too smart-ass for their own good and didn't know how to interact with the community because they didn't know how to interact with other people. And then he, he fell, he's now in school here in New York City getting his electrical engineering degree and working with the community to bring Wi-Fi to the whole borough. So, I mean, it's a really interesting story, but yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, here. Hi. Um, thanks for sharing your work. I have a question. Sometimes you say make a picture and sometimes you say take a picture. Is there a difference for you or those terms interchangeable? They are not interchangeable. I was being sloppy. Thank you for catching me on that. <laughs> because, oh, well, I mean, post Susan Sontag, the idea of taking a picture is just so transgressive. I'm taking your picture. Nothing you can do about it, damn it. It's like you should, yes, I like to be generous. I like to make images. I don't like to be taking things from people. But um, I was speaking in the vernacular and being sloppy. So usually you say make, make I do, a I do, I do, I do. Thank you. Um, other questions? You guys in the back are really slacking. You must have been <laughs> napping. Uh, thank you so much for showing us these uh, images. I was just wondering why, um, what is this resistance that you have towards calling yourself a photojournalist? I mean, you're, you're sort of, they're very photojournalistic, the images, and, and you're going out there and you're recording an event. Yeah, I was, I, was play, I was playing a photojournalist on TV, it's true. But I can't really be a photojournalist even now because there are things, oh my God, I am so loosey-goosey with this work I had, okay, nothing, I can't move heads, nothing, everything has to be exactly right. I don't know how the photojournalists do that. I can do, there were images in the Island series, like there was one maybe like, if you remember the ones with the posters of the, of the man and woman in the same poses, maybe the poster of the guy is a little bit bigger than when I saw it in real life, but I made it bigger so you could see it more easily. I mean, stuff like that happens. Um, but in the Occupy work, nothing like that ever happened. Everything, I was very careful about that. But even more so than that, even more so, that process that I told you, like when I came here today, honest to goodness, you know, Mark said, please don't read anything. <laughs> you can pass this as around. This is what I wrote. This is what I wrote to myself to give the talk. Those were my notes. It's like when you get to be 53 years old, if you don't know your own life, well then maybe you, I don't know, maybe you should have a drink and see a shrink or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's like, I went to the Occupy protest each day and I didn't know what I was going to find. I came here and I said, well, I will talk about the things that need to be talked about. And I got there and I saw who was there and I would respond to that. And the photojournalists, that's not how they work. Um, I spoke with a photojournalist who teaches at CUNY, and he said this is a problem in the field when I mentioned this to him, but how most people were working was their assignment editors had given them an angle. The angle was hot young men at Occupy or whatever it was that day. They were going to find that thing and illustrate that idea. It was just the most bizarre notion because I was thinking these are people who are gathering the news. Well, how do you know what the news is before you've arrived at the scene of the event to find out what's going on? You can't have decided in your editorial room what's really happening before you even get there. It was just so cart before the horse. I still have trouble with it, but I understand, like I understand what that police officer told me, the, how you get there you have to turn around and deliver a product in an incredibly short amount of time. You don't have a lot of time to process. And one of the shorthands, and it's not a good shorthand, is to create this system of determining what the story is ahead of time. And it leads to people saying, oh, that story is over after they cleared the park. There's no more story. It's all gone. Bye-bye. And it makes you understand the world slightly differently because you realize, you know, as the famous Malcolm X quote goes, the revolution will not be televised. And it's one of those things where, yeah, um, you have to go out and find it for yourself. And again, we come back to this idea of responsibility because as an artist, you're responsible for being true and, and showing what you know. It's about, you know, my work there was making that visible. Um, each of you, the people who I spoke with today, 
You're working on real things that people need to know about, that people need to see. If you don't make it, no one else is going to make it. Trust me. So you better make it now. Yeah. Um, I, I like what you said about having a responsibility for, you know, the images that you make and like, you know, it's important to be a good citizen. And yeah, I mean, if we don't make it, who else will? But then the irony is, is like, I mean, in a way, the truer we are to the images that we make, uh, once they go out in the world, we actually lose control of them and they take on a life of their own? Damn kids. <laughs> yeah, it's right, just like your kids. You make them, you like, you pour all that love into them, and then they go out and get a damn tattoo or something. <laughs> I know you all got tattoos. Um, yeah, they go out into the world and you hope they make you proud, um, but you don't know. Um, that's just, that's how it goes. Um, and that's why you really have to be careful. You know, you, you put that energy into the work because that energy lives on. You know, if we're lucky, the work gets to last a few lifetimes. I mean, heck, you go to that wing of the Met and there's stuff from, what, 4000 BC in the Egyptian wing and up in the China, up in the East Asian wing, they got stuff from China that's three and 4000 BC too. I mean, if, I, God knows, I mean, I don't know, who, if, I work on paper for God's sake because all that stuff is stone. But um, for those of you who work in stone, you're much, got much better chance. Um, but yeah, um, we can only hope. Even works on paper, even a nicely made photograph. There's photographs kicking around from the beginning of photography, 1839, and all those people are dead. So I don't know. I'll, I, if, if, if I'm lucky, some things will pass on to the next generations. And that's all you can hope, to be in dialogue with the people who are concerned with making images and concerned at looking at images. Yeah. Such a polite school. I love this. Thank you. Uh, I enjoyed your uh, presentation a lot. You mentioned one of my favorite books, uh, Russell Shorto's Island at the Center of the World, which, for those of you who are interested in New York City, it's, it's a wonderful history of the city. And you, you s what I saw after, or learned out from reading that book was how much the character of this city today in 2016 bears the imprint of the first people who lived here. From the very start in the so 1630s, crazy. it was multicultural. It was a bunch of rapacious, i.e. people out to make money. Uh, All who those were, pilgrims up in, in Boston, they hated our guts right from the start, before drunk. the Yankees and the Red Sox. They, were they just hated us all. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was nuts. And it was like, it was multilingual and multicultural from the very start, and tolerant. Yes, and right? tolerant. I mean, tolerant, and you had, it was nice to have money. It made the tolerance much easier, but, um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, oh my God, I mean, there were ex-slave pirates hanging out with ladies from society, yeah. Mixed marriages in the 17th century. It was like, you know, not what the pilgrims saw in their shiny city on the hill. Right, so the pilgrims started Boston. They were the ones who found 17th century England too tolerant. So oh, yeah, they, no, if, if, if so you speak to the Brits to today, the Brits today said, good riddance for those pilgrims, all a bunch of people with sticks up their butts. They're just really <laughs> nasty, So as someone who grew up people. in Boston, that seemed very familiar, too. But, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, we're recapitulating that whole New York but Boston. I wonder, <laughs> <laughs> but th that was all preface to my question, which is what inspired you to take these photographs of New York as, uh, your, a portrait of the city as 40 islands, what inspired you? There was another book, and I'm forgetting the author's name, it was a husband and wife, um, Stuart Wright, that's the husband's name, I forget, because he interviewed me for a piece for the Times. Um, they wrote a book called The Other Islands of New York City. And I heard them on NPR, NPR head, as is many an artist here in New York City in their studio. And I went out and got the book. I thought it was just insane. And I didn't do anything for several years took a gig in Chicago, came back and realized, well, it's time to start work on that project. Um, because no one had done anything with it. It was so, it was obvious, they'd been on the radio, maybe a million people heard that day, but no one was doing anything. And so, 
it was just up to me to make those pictures of the islands. Um, and, oh, no, that's not true. Christine Osinski, who teaches at Cooper, she had made an attempt, but her images, she had just literally run around to each one and, or not, I don't know if she even got to each one, but the images, uh, she, it, it's hugely expensive and daunting. I've been working at it since 08, and I'm just kind of gathering steam now to get to a lot of the islands. Like those little islands, that's an $800 boat ride. Jeez. Yeah, each island. Um, because I have to, I, you, don't want, you don't want to be rowing yourself around New York City islands, trust me. <laughs> um, so yeah, so it, it, it's, it's a little bit of change. So that book got me started, and there's a funny story because I had a solo show at the Queens Museum in 2014, and the Times wanted to do a piece on it. And I said, oh, I know this great writer, can you assign her? And they say, because she's written for the Times, before. they said, no, we have another writer. So Stuart calls me up, I'm a visiting artist at Bowdoin at that point, and um, he asked me the same question, and he starts laughing, because it's his wife in his book that I was my inspiration for the project, and it was too perfect. You need a friend with a boat. I do. Yeah. I know. So, on, on that subject, do you, do you know the artist Marie Lorenz? She does the, the, the tide and water. I, I her name know. is familiar. I think I've met her. I've seen her work, I think, but I don't know her personally. I've been on a ride in her rowboat, um, to We tried to go to Hell's Gate. Oh, yeah. Oh, that, the currents are very dangerous we got around Hell's Gate. over by the water police because it was too dangerous. Oh, no. Hell's Gate is famous. The currents, um, the circle line once got trapped in the currents underneath Hell's Gate, and they have a motor on their thingy. But she would take you, but your, your camera might be in danger. Oh, yeah. No, I have a dry bag. Uh, the dry <laughs> bag is essential. For those who don't know the water, a dry bag will keep anything dry even if it goes overboard. So all my camera equipment's in a dry bag. Um, but yeah, because to get to some of these islands, I was in a kayak once the boat got us there because the, there's, no, there's no pier. So you have to like go up in a kayak. And the kayak I was in was oh, so chumpy. You totally wet butt, just really, just whatever. Okay, yes. Um, other questions, because I know that's too fascinating, my comfort. <laughs> yes. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation and your work, um, and if you don't mind, and if uh, she doesn't mind, I, w I w was wondering if we could maybe hear from um, some of the protesters that you worked with that were here tonight. Hmm? Oh, you are And maybe what they're working on? Yeah, if sure, Sue, if, if you don't okay. mind. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> um, as of now... Oh, they're going to pass the microphone. That way you'll be heard on the video. Thank you. No problem. I don't know if this is working, but... Uh, as of now, I've been working with uh, Food Now Bombs, which is an uh, anarchist collective uh, where we get food, don't, uh, donate, donated food, and we cook uh, every Sunday uh, to distribute it at Tompkins Square Park because um, we think that the government is spending way too much money on building weapons and bombs to destroy people's lives. and. It is the government isn't spending enough money on helping out the citizens that are, well, not citizens, just people in general living uh, here. Uh, because as we can see, hunger persists, uh, hunger is everywhere. So we try to um, alleviate hunger in New York City. But Funa Bombs is a global movement. You can see, you can find Funa Bombs uh, pretty much everywhere in the major cities. You see, when Sue says stuff like that, it makes me feel totally like I'm just like doing nothing at all. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's absolutely brilliant. And I felt really honored to be able to photograph people like Sue because they're working so hard to make a difference. And while, you know, I, you, everyone does what they can. And so Sue is doing the heavy lifting and I'm making sure it's visible. I guess on that note, that's a good note to end on. Museum of the City of New York, among others. He's had solo exhibitions at the Whitney Museum, the Chicago Cultural Center, and the Martha Schneider Gallery. And he's been included in group shows at the Brooklyn Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum, uh, Photography Gallery, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Anacostia Museum at the Smithsonian. 
currently across at work on a survey of more than 40 islands that make up New York City and is also completing an artist book for Public Art Commission in Luxembourg. He received a BA from Princeton in art history and studio art and an MA in art history from the IFA, the Institute of Fine Art at NYU. He's represented by Stephen Kasher Gallery here in New York. Please join me in welcoming Across Shep. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Mark, for inviting me. Um, uh, wow, okay, I don't want to take too much time because I do talk a lot and we, there's a lot to go through, but I'm very impressed by all the work that I saw this afternoon. I hadn't known I was going to see like the entire encyclopedia of all art that people make in one afternoon, but I did. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to say is that I am not a photojournalist. I'll say it again, I'm not a photojournalist. I don't even know how to do what they do. Um, and so it was 2011, and I was like hearing reports about like something happening downtown, and I emailed friends, and they were like, we're out of town, I don't know what's happening downtown. And so I went downtown, and I was just blown away because in my city, something miraculous had happened. I mean, something terrible had happened years earlier. Um, the political pendulum had swung so far to the right that everything I had grown up as a child with was erased, kind of like a big wind had come along and blown it all away. And now it seemed that the pendulum was swinging back the other way, and what's more, it was like swinging back right where I lived. Um, Good evening. It's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Accra Shep. Accra and I met on a balmy uh, August evening last summer uh, at Cat Jam. Um, some old friends of Accra's um, got together and bought a dilapidated Shakespeare camp uh, up in Sullivan County, I guess. Somewhere up there in the in the in the in the in the Catskills, and every summer they invite all their friends to come up there and camp out, and they invite musicians, and they had this amazing band from Mali, and my first impression of Accra was him dancing with his shirt off at like you know midnight out under the stars, just, and then at one point twerking. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> And, uh, and then the next morning, um, he was sitting outside on a bench in the sun having a cup of coffee, and we had a very brief uh, conversation that convinced me on the spot, and then confirmed after Googling him and checking out his work, that he had to come here and visit studios and, uh, and talk to you guys. Because um, I think he's, well, you will soon see, uh, those of you who haven't met him yet, um, what an amazing, uh, creative personality he is. He's also a New York-based photographer whose work looks at international protest movements and how natural environments influence human interaction. In 2011, Accra began, uh, he documented um, the Occupy Wall Street movement in Zuccotti Park, and a selection of this series was included in the book, uh, The Order of Things, which was published in conjunction with a show at the Walter Collection uh, in Germany. His work is in the collections of the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museum of Modern Art, the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, and the Museum Figuring I would find it. So I was interested in individuals. That was one thing that I couldn't understand what people couldn't see, because the people who made up this protest were all people who had just, like me, decided to go. And at first, I didn't include myself in them. It wasn't until a couple of years later that I decided that I could say, yeah, I'd been part of it, because I was documenting it, which meant that I was looking at all sides of the protest. Because you can't really have a protest just with one side. You have to have opposition. And I was interested in all sides. So I wanted to photograph the police. I wanted to photograph the business people. This guy was just brilliant because I was so afraid of photographing the police, because 
you know, well, they could break my camera. My camera's made out of wood, by the way, so it's just, it's not like, you know, it's, and it's on a tripod, and I have a hood over my head. I'm just like, I have to make sure that I'm on the good side of everyone. And so I very timidly asked this guy, I said, so can I, can I make a picture of you? And I have the camera right in front of me. And he kind of goes, Rumph! and then he turns and gives me this profile. And I'm like, okay, that's a yes. <laughs> And um, I mean, it's like he's like got such an amazingly powerful face, straight out of central casting for your strong cop guy. Um, so coming back to this idea of um, the protest being individual, something that I kept seeing and I kept hearing afterwards, it's like people wanted to understand the protest as a sea of people. They wanted they wanted to see little, little circles for faces and lots of hands. They wanted to see a mass of humanity. I mean, I, I frankly didn't understand what that was supposed to mean. Um, I mean, there is the very famous photograph that Ouija made of, the, um, of, the, of, of Coney Island with the masses of people, but it's brilliant because... So I went down there um, the next day with my 4x5 camera and because um, I knew I wanted to see things really, really closely, and that meant I needed something with a big piece of film, something to record a lot of information. And this place where it was, the protest was being held, Zuccotti Park, it was really dark. I love these kids. These are kids from, oh, some university in Florida they had come up. They just like came up from Florida, it's just wild. Um, and there's no light in this park. It just drains everything of color. So it was like, okay, well, I don't need color film then. I'll just use black and white film, so I'm good. Um, and I thought I would be done right away. I thought, wow, look at all these people with video cameras and all these people with all these devices of, for, for capturing images. Oh, you know. I can get back to my other work soon. And I would talk to these other artists, and I would take a look at their work that they were posting online, and no one was seeing the protest that I was seeing. And it's interesting because since that time, people your age are really concerned with social justice, even as you do all the other things that you do in your very busy lives, including getting high and partying, you're still concerned about social justice in a way that I can honestly say that the, path, the generations, the two generations that came before you, not so much. And in that time, I was like, what I saw were individuals. I saw this woman, she was working in food services, donated food. People were just driving up to the protest and saying, hey, I got a carload of stuff to give you. Where should I put it? That's what was happening. People didn't know where the protest was. They just knew it was downtown. I just went to Wall Street and listened. We can also see individuals. I love these, oh God. So. That's right, that's right. And I better go see that show because I haven't seen the Coney Island show. It's closing soon. Um, so the woman, the young woman on the left, I saw her first, and I was making her photograph. And then she said, can my friend be in the photograph? And I said, oh my god, yes, absolutely. Because to me, it was just such a powerful, a powerful thing to say that these two young women in hijabs were part of Occupy Wall Street. They were students at the time at the borough of Manhattan Community College. I didn't get their names, and so sadly I didn't get them a copy of their photograph. I tried to get everyone a copy of their photograph um, because they were nice enough to stop and let me make their picture. Um, but the idea that they could be part of this protest, that they are part of New York, part of the United States, is something that too often is lost. The idea that, that everyone gets to belong. Now, of course, that's something that we're coming to grips with, especially in this election year. But in New York, 
that's something that we take for granted. That's something that I really, really love about this city. Um, and evidently, I, I read a book called The Island at the Center of the World, talks about the colonial beginnings of New York City. It was kind of built in right when the Dutch came. She's amazing. I didn't even get where she was from. She's my hippie chick. Um, she's just great. Um, and so to circle back around, so I thought that after a couple of weeks I could leave off. But I wasn't seeing these photographs of these individuals. I was seeing people making glib images. Um, the very first photographers I saw 